earlier on too, you did some work, uh, war work during World War II. What was what was that about? I don't know if we've heard. Well, that. when I first heard Swami Ashokananda, that was in 1937. Uh, I suddenly discovered that there's something behind this universe that I didn't know about, you see. By 1940, I wanted to join the monastery. He sent me back to the university to just finish my scientific training so we could put science and Vedanta together, you see, like this. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what was the question you asked me? About what the work you were doing during World War II. Oh, you did some oh, work yes. for the war? Or? So, so, he sent me back to the university. So I graduated from the university in 1980, in 1943. And that was a... We're in the middle of World War II. And if you graduate from the University of California in 1943, and you're a male with two feet on the ground, you have only two choices on Monday, a war work job or a rifle. Mm -hmm. There are no other choices on Monday if you graduate on Sunday, unless you're a girl. The girls didn't have that problem, but the boys had that problem. And I graduated in 43. And so I had to have a war work job on Monday. So the war, for first job that I had was finding out what to do if they use gas. So that, I did that for most of a year. And then the boss got killed by a phosgene accident. And uh, I reapplied at the at the radi at the uh, Manhattan Project at the radiation lab, oh, really? and so they took they took me on there. They said they would take anybody from Sam Rubin's group, sight unseen. They wanted to know if anybody else was available when the old man died. Anyway, so I was the only one they took. So you uh, in college, you your degree was in chemistry, I think. Chemistry and math, yeah. Chemistry and math. So you were a valuable commodity at that time then. Well, this, th this should be interesting. Johannes wants to know if you, what you think about life in other parts of the universe, extraterrestrial life. I have enough trouble with what's here. Yeah. <laughs> I, I should have predicted that <laughs> answer. But do you, you think we're the only ones, or are there others having enough trouble uh, with their lives in other places? The, the history of the, the long genetic history that gave rise to people who can talk, talk English is very complicated, and I would not expect it to repeat in some other place. Okay. If we hadn't been marooned on an island in Africa, we would be chimps. But you see, marooned on an island in Africa the food is underwater. So, body language fails in the surf. Mm -hmm. So we had to do something else. So we learned to do this. I see. Okay. And then when we, when we got back on land, that's to say when we were a long ways from the water, we were walker, we were talkers in those days, but language is very complicated. And I'm pretty sure that we put this big brain on here to do language, not to talk, not for talking, for doing Sanskrit. Sanskrit's a hell of a complicated affair, yeah, okay? Yeah, I've heard. Languages don't have to be that complicated. Look, I used to talk to in Chinese, we can get along without all that cattle feces. <laughs> okay. You know, we, we, going back to the um, telescope making, Kanad in uh, India wanted to know about how accurate you can get a mirror made out of float glass, uh, like the porthole glass. Do you ever measure the accuracy? Do you know how accurate your mirrors are? Our mirrors are accurate to one one thousandth of the thickness of saran wrap. Slice your saran wrap into a thousand sheets, throw away 999, give or take the last sheet is the tolerance on our mirrors. We know what the tolerance is. 
It, it, is it ever measured it, it, in uh, optical terms like uh, fractions of a wavelength or something? Did you ever have them tested? An eighth of a wave. Eighth of a wave is oh, very good. Some of our mirrors are good to a twentieth of a wave. Probably. Really? Yeah. That's a, that's great. Yeah. So that's wonderful. Um, Robert uh, has a question. You see, four four professional astronomers have told me they never had a better show through anything than through our 24-incher. These are professional astronomers. Yeah. These are not pe kids off the sidewalk. They don't get to look through their telescopes very often. So they always have a camera, a spectrograph or something. No, no. No, no. No, these are professional astronomers who look through those big telescopes. Mm -hmm. And they, they tell me that. Yeah. Never had a better show through anything than through our 24-incher. Our 24-incher doesn't have an observatory over it to spoil the show. Right. So um, Robert points out that uh, the it, young people are not as interested in astronomy now as when we were younger. Uh, you know, I, I started in astronomy from the earliest time, and it was not unusual, but we're getting older. We don't see as many young people in the United States. I know in some other countries I've been to, it's mostly young people. But here in the U.S., people aren't as interested. What do you think is the cause? What can we do about that? TV is the cause. Hmm. <laughs> so so how, do we, how do we break that cycle? More sidewalk astronomy? You have a, you have a power failure. That's... Well, that would improve the skies over Los Angeles here, wouldn't it? <laughs> now, Andy has an interesting question, too, going back to uh, when you were young in China. As a young boy, what interested you most in science? Was it astronomy or other things? I don't know. My dad was a zoologist. <clears throat> and I remember showing him a rock one time and asked him, what kind of a rock is this? What does he do? He smells it. He's a zoologist. <laughs> That's not how you find out what kind of rock it is by smelling it. Anyway, I thought that was very funny. Even then, you thought so. But I was interested in all sorts of things. All sorts of things. And we'd curl up as if we were going into, we were pupating. Oh, I see. You were, you were playing out the uh, yeah. insect life yeah. cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I guess that's that's really what it takes, but uh, you had a different upbringing and... Uh, a different what? A different upbringing. You, you grew up in, in, in China with uh, scientific... Not very many people probably were raised by a, zoolo a Canadian zoologist in China. <laughs> no, I, maybe we'll hear from some. <laughs> but I knew three of them, my three brothers. Three brothers, okay. <laughs> And what, uh, were, were you the older, younger? I was number two. But let me tell you, in World War, in World War II, my mother was very lucky. She had four boys of war age, and only one of them got in the military. My youngest brother was a radio man in a submarine in the war. The rest of us were in radiation. The rest of us were in the radiation lab. In the Manhattan Project? And my, my doctor brother, the one for, you're just younger than me, was in charge of the World Health Organization Radiation Department in Geneva for nine years. So he was over there. All his kids are fluent in French. Oh, interesting. That's great. Um... Well, we have just a, a, a few minutes more, I guess. That's what the chime is telling us. Um, you know, Orlando wanted to ask, too, and I'll, about whether or not you ever worked on refractors, but I'll broaden that question a little bit. Have you worked on other kinds of telescopes? No, uh, I haven't. All of your telescopes have been pretty much the same basic type of design. I started out on ship's windows. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and you stayed on ship's windows. I stayed on ship's windows. Yeah. I've pushed a little bit of other glass, but not very much. Where did you uh, get the idea for making the type of Altaz mount that you made? You, you, didn't, you didn't make the first one. You didn't invent the Altaz telescope. We're just, you see, it's not an invention. A, a, a device that tracks things across the sky for photography, that's an invention. 
A Dobsonian is a non-invention. We're not going to do that. We just want to be able to push it around this way and push it up and down this way. Is that so difficult? This way, you turn around over three pieces of Teflon. Up and down this way, you do it over four pieces of Teflon. But as soon as I felt... You see, Teflon was new when I ran into it. And all I did at the, at the junk store, you see, was to feel that Teflon, and I knew right away what to do with it. <laughs> but what we used to do is to take military circular saw blades, two military circular saw blades. Let's see. Did we use two circular? No, one circular saw blade. Oh dear, I've forgotten now how we used to do those things. But we used to do, we used to buy circular saw blades mm -hmm. from the military for our ground, for our lower bearings. Mm -hmm. But when I felt Teflon, that was the end of the saw blades. Yeah. And uh, what you were doing was different in that the the mount, the whole mount itself rotated, not on a tripod or anything. It is on a tripod, but the tripod is three feet on a board, on a big thick board. Okay. But they're only three feet on the floor. Now, what do you think about the commercial Dotsonians now? The idea that what you were doing... Some of them are pretty good. Uh -huh. And you think that's a, this is a good thing that uh, the, th this type of telescope has been, become a, a major commercial They can project. supply telescopes from China, Dobsonian telescopes from China, at a fairly reasonable fee. If you get it made in this country, it's going to cost a lot more money. So we're back to China and uh, where you came from in the first place. But they don't have ship's windows to make them out of. No. Otherwise, they could make them cheaper. The glass is expensive. Yeah. Pyrex glass is expensive. But they Those have, portal glasses were cheap. Yeah. They have uh, machines to grind the mirrors for us now. Oh, yeah. They do. T that they have... Do it by machine, too, while they have breakfast. Um, Raghu in India asks about superstitions. You get, you know, we all get these questions. People have some strange ideas. Uh, have you ever gotten some good stories or ones that you remember? And, and how, do you, how do you deal with them? I, I, I have a feeling you have no problem uh, telling people what you think. I have enough trouble with people that I can see easily. Anyway, I'm not much for spooks. I have enough trouble with things that I can see through a telescope. <laughs> well, John, it's, it, it's been an hour, lunchtime here now, and uh, I'd like to thank you for spending this time. Uh, and I see here we got a comment too, Rob, it's letting me know that all the people in the, in the chat who are watching are thanking you uh, for your time as well. And... Uh, Thoroughly in, enjoyed hearing from you and consider it a real privilege, and I feel privileged to be a part of this too. So uh, thank you from all of us okay. in many different countries. My present problem is a very different problem. Why do we have a universe at all? That's a very different kind of problem. Well, yes. And we don't have time to talk about that. I'm afraid not. <laughs> Next time. Okay. okay. <laughs> we'll get to that. So that's it, and I want to thank you for joining us from the Vedanta Society Center in, in Hollywood, California, on a beautiful day here with, with John Dobson, 95 years young and still as sharp as ever. Thanks for joining us.